as we return back to our seats and go into our time to hear and respond to a message from God's Word. I invite us to just open our Bibles and we're going to begin where we left off last week. And we're actually going to be turning back eventually to that Matthew passage, Matthew 25, that parable of the talents. And so I invite you to turn there where we left off last week. But before I even get into this message today, I have to start off with a formal apology. A very, very important apology. Ray Grimm informed me last Sunday I lied from this, this podium. I lied to you. And, and you know what? He was right. I did. I fibbed. I didn't know I did, but you know what? Even if you don't know if you're lying and you end up lying, you're still a liar. And I said that General Sherman was the tallest tree in the world. He quickly informed me I was wrong. Um, that it's a redwood up in Washington State. Humble County. In the Redwood National Park. That the General Sherman is not the tallest tree in the world. It's the world's largest living thing. Which I think is pretty equivalent, if you ask me. But Ray told me, no, no, it's not. There's no equivalence at all there. But I stand corrected. Thank you, Mr. Grimm. So, as we go into our time to hear and respond to a message from God's Word, once again, we are going to be picking up where we left off last week because there's so much to still be discovered, even in that one passage we were looking at last week from Ephesians 2.10. But we will be eventually turning to Matthew chapter 25 again, verses 14 through 30, the parable of the talents to talk about the challenge that we left off with last week to remind us of this thing we're talking about today called calling. Because I don't know about you, but I have a memory of a goldfish. I hardly remember conversations I had yesterday, yet alone what I preached on the, fall, the following Sunday, or the past Sunday. I'm lucky because I have manuscripts of my messages that I can go back on and look at. Um, I understand that many of you don't have that blessing to be able to be like, oh yeah, that's what that guy talked about. <laughs> All joking aside, I say this because it's important to remind us of the existential question we dealt with last week, that question about our very existence. Is there more than this? Is there more to this life? In particular, is there more to this life of faith than this Sunday ritual we are all engaged in where we come, we sing these songs, we, we say these things we call prayers, and we listen to this guy jab his jaws for 30 minutes. Hopefully only 30 minutes this time. Is there more to life than this? And I think it's a question that many of us ask. And last week we discussed how the simple and short answer is, yes, there is so much more than this. There is so much more that God has in store for those who come to know who Jesus is and bring that to the forefront of their lives. Patricia said it best by making Jesus the subject, not an object of our life, but no, the subject that everything would orient towards and as we read in Ephesians 2.10 last week, where we read that it's for we are his workmanship. Once again, this word workmanship could also be masterpiece. It's more, it's more emphasis on that idea of masterpiece, that we are his masterpieces created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That God has done this mighty work in us. He has made us into these masterpieces. Because once again, that word, that word was to, to explain an artist's work, an artist's work, whether it would be the Colosseum, which is a masterpiece. But it was something that would exemplify that particular artist. It was like the Starry Night, Van Gogh. It was much like the Sistine Chapel for Michelangelo. It was their masterpieces. This word in Greek meant that. Not just workmanship, but masterpiece. And you are those masterpieces. But why did God do it? What for? It says in Ephesians 2.10, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, making it clear God does have a purpose for you and for me. God has a calling 
He has a mission for each and every one of us, something that we clarified last week into two different things, a general calling, which God has given each and every one of us to go forth and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded, that we all have this great and wonderful general calling. And it's when we can learn to live in that general calling to be light and salt to this world, when we can learn to live in this general calling to know Christ and to make him known, that we can discover something we call a specific calling. The typical thing that we talk about in the church when we talk about words like calling, like what is your calling? We're talking about that specific calling that each and every one of us has as a member of the body of Christ. The specific function that he's given us in the time and place that we're in. You know, something we're going to discuss in coming weeks is that that specific calling changes throughout our life. It does. It's not just a a once and this is my calling and this is all I'm going to do because there's still even so much more to this life of faith than just that. But how we have to live out that general calling first and foremost if we ever hope to find the great gift, that great specific calling, the, the thing that God initially invested into our lives that we would do, those good works that he had prepared beforehand, the good works he had in mind when he was knitting you together in your mother's womb. Because we all do have that great general calling, that calling given to the original disciples, carried, passed down generation to generation to us that we see in Acts 1-8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. A calling we carry on to this day to be his witnesses in Exeter, in the whole valley, all of California and throughout the entire world, to the ends of the world. And it starts here. Discovering that thing we talk about a lot in the church today, that thing we call calling, begins here. Living as God's witnesses, being Christ's ambassadors, being vessels of which God pours his blessings out on to the whole world, to be that salt and light. Where we left off last week with Matthew 25 the parable of the talents, asking a very important question. What have we done with that initial investment that God made in our lives? The Gospel of Matthew shows us a moment where Jesus taught about just that question. It says this in verse 14, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. To each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. And he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went away, dug in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And also who had two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own in interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. 
For to everyone who has will more be given, and he who has will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Leading us to last week's challenge. What have we done with the initial investment that God's made in our lives? Understanding that initial investment isn't a small little thing. Even these talents that it keeps talking about aren't small little things. You know, we read the word talent and we have no clue what it means in, in our culture. We don't know what a talent was. But a talent wasn't just a small sum of money. It was something of great value, significant value. It was believed that it would be equivalent to hundreds of thousands of dollars today. And this master isn't leaving no little thing to his servants to take care of. He's leaving his entire life savings to his servants. And even the servant that got the one, who got the one talent, that was of significant and great value. I mean, and what God has done to us, what God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ, is of even greater, even greater than the five talents multiplied into ten. It is so much greater. What have we done with that investment? Did we do that self-examination that we were challenged with in asking, are we living out that great and wonderful purpose that God has given us all to go forth and to make more and better disciples, to grow as a disciple ourselves? What have we been doing to know Christ? And to make him known. Understanding with where we're going to be going today. In the same passage, Ephesians 2.10, because there's so much more to learn there about calling. But understanding that it begins with that. It begins with living out that great and general calling if we ever hope to find that more specific purpose that Jesus has for us in this life. But it does... It begins here, because Ephesians 2.10 shows us this, that we are his workmanship created in. Created in who, though? Who does it say we've been created in? Christ Jesus. We are his masterpieces created in Christ Jesus. We have been created in and through Jesus Christ. We have been born again in and through Jesus Christ. We are empowered in and through Jesus Christ and Him sending His Holy Spirit upon us for those wonderful works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We can't read this passage and forget Jesus. He's the center of it. He's the subject of it. And He is the center and subject of our life's purpose. It all begins with Jesus And we have to ask a really important question with this when we're asking, you know, where can I find this thing called calling? Can it be found? I don't know about you, but in this day and age, I get decision fatigue so much. There's so many choices we have at, like, just we have this buffet of possibilities in life. Choosing where to eat sometimes, if you're eating out, can be just a nightmare for me because I'm just like, there's so many options. I don't know about you, but that's something I struggle with. How do we find it? Can it even be found? Where is it even found? It's found in Jesus. And it has to start with Jesus. Because we are created in Christ Jesus. He's the one who's done this work in us. He's the one who is calling us. No one else. He's the one that is empowering us. You know, it kind of reminds me of the baptismal moments of Jesus in the words of John the Baptist before he baptized Jesus. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Who? Jesus. Jesus will do this work, no one else. And I think about what it is we actually celebrate in baptism. Because you might be asking, what does baptism have to do with calling? It has everything to do with calling. Because it shows us what must happen in our lives 
for us to truly walk in the purposes that God had created for us beforehand. The purposes that Jesus went to the cross for, that we would work, walk in these good works that he's prepared for you. Baptism perfectly shows us what needs to happen in our lives. What is it we celebrate in baptism? We do. We celebrate the repentant heart. We celebrate the turning from our old self to our new self, but we celebrate something much more significant. We celebrate death. We celebrate the death of our old self and the rebirth in Christ to the newness of life that he comes to give and bring. We celebrate us letting go of what was before and taking hold of what is now. It's a weird thing. We cheer for baptisms, don't we? We cheer and celebrate death. We do, because it's a good death, and it's the death of something that needs to die in each and every one of us, especially if we want to find this thing called calling in our lives. We need to learn to die. Paul explains it best in Colossians 2, 12 through 13. He says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. That old, alienated, sinful self dies. That old heart that had nothing to do with God died to be risen again in Christ, to the newness of life that Christ comes to bring. Finding our calling, it begins with living out that general calling, but to even live out that general calling that God has given us to be salt and light to this world begins here. It begins in death. In fact, it was the great German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, who says this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And this is exactly what God calls If we recall Jesus' words from Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Which is why Paul so elegantly put it in Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me we can't live that life unless we first die we have to die to our selfish ambitions to be risen again to a selfless aspiration a selfless aspiration for god and for others we have to die to this world's selfishness and be risen in christ's selflessness to walk in those good works that God prepared for each and every one of us beforehand. As he was creating each and every one of us, those works that he was thinking, Donna, she's going to be doing this and that, and she's going to change the world. And Donna, the power of Christ in you is the power to change the world. Each and every one of you have that power to bring Jesus to the whole of creation, to be those signposts that point to God. The question we have to ask is, are we going to walk in it? Are we going to be created in Christ Jesus, knowing that that means certain and sure death? It means taking up our cross and following. Are we going to be willing to do it? I think about my own life and what God's done in my life. You know, I'd always use the, the, the language that God replaced my dreams. He replaced my desires and passions. And in a way, he did. There were cer- certain things in my life that needed to be replaced. There was definitely things in my life that needed to completely die and expire and go away. But more so, he didn't just replace things. He elevated others. He brought to life things that were dead inside of me. He brought to life things that he had built into me and into my life and elevated it to a greater purpose, to a greater desire, to a greater passion. Now, once again, there were some things he just kicked to the curb. 
because they had no place in my life with him and in my walk with him. But I think about my life before Christ. I think about what it is that Jesus did in my life. You know, I was living the American dream. You know, it wasn't a dream to me. It was a reality. I was given this great opportunity as a high schooler to go to a place called Prosser School of Technology, and I was getting certifications that people normally wouldn't get until they were 30. And I had these, I had Cisco certifications, networking certifications, computer repair certifications out the wazoo. I was, I was doing it. I was figuring it out, and my teacher at Prosser, because of my success, had already lined up a job for me to do with UPS as a network administrator. And mind you, this is 2004. That was like the big and up-and-coming thing. And I had a job lined up to do while I was in college. Not to mention, even though my grades outside of Prosser were horrible, I'd never get into college, God blessed me with a gift of running. I was a great competitive runner, and I actually had schools fighting to get me to come and run for them. I mean, it wasn't a dream for me. It was a reality. I was living it. You know, it was just like, my road was paved. Then Jesus. Jesus wrecked me. And when I say he wrecked me, he wrecked me out of the rat race that I was entering in. The rat race that most young people get trapped in, thinking that success means lots of money. Success means that you don't have to worry about things and that you'll have all the money you ever need to do whatever you needed to do. That success means you'd have this really, really nice, fancy title and job. He wrecked me out of that. He killed me. And he brought me to life to a new journey. May of my senior year, I was sitting under my pastor, Pete Baumgartel, and he pre preached the message from 2 Timothy 4. And if you don't know anything about 2 Timothy chapter 4, it starts with this, that I, Paul, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to preach the word in season and out, to correct, to rebuke, to encourage, because a time is coming when people are going to gather around them, teachers who will only teach them what their itching ears desire to hear. But as for you, you will walk in that manner worthy of your calling. And of course, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but that is what Paul charges Timothy in, my pastor took that back to Romans where it talks about faith comes by hearing. And who's going to ever hear if no one ever preaches? Christ grabbed a hold of my life. Yeah, I've been a Christian for a couple of years at this point. I've been following Jesus passionately for a couple of years at this point. I was living out that general calling, but boy, that day, God grabbed hold of my life in a powerful way. His spirit spoke to me in a powerful way. And it was almost as if he audibly told me, you're going to be doing what Pete's doing someday. And I'm like, me? I'm a computer guy. I have everything figured out, God. But no, it was May of my senior year that I changed my, the entire course trajectory of my life because Christ changed me. Because Christ grabbed a hold of me. And all I have to say, it was so great to die. It was so great to let that go. Because you also want to know something? God has used every bit of my former life in the new life that he's given me. I've been blessed with so many opportunities to work with non-for-profits and churches in the form of IT support. In fact, I was a network administrator for the Evansville Rescue Mission in Indiana for multiple years, helping them redesign their entire communication structure I've also been blessed and gifted with to use the gifts that God's given me with HTML, CSS, PHP to design websites for many non-for-profits and churches to help further the name of Jesus. And I just think about it. I'm just like, God has used those things. He didn't replace them. He didn't take those parts of my life away. He elevated them because God uses every part of us. He created every part of you. And you may find your calling, that specific calling that God has given you, has a lot to do with the gifts and talents that you already possess. That he's telling you to use those gifts and talents to help further his kingdom. That there's people who need your gifts and talents in the body of Christ. And so often when we talk about gifts, we think of spiritual gifts. And yes, the Spirit gives us these wonderful spiritual gifts that are powerful. But he also gives us some gifts like 
being able to network computers together properly, about being able to design a website. He gives us gifts of knowledge. He gives us gifts of ability as well, which is something we're going to be digging into a lot more in the coming weeks. But for today, to know that God doesn't just change and replace things. He elevates them. I still have some of the same passions that I had before knowing Christ in my life. In particular, I'm a gamer. Hi, my name is Brandon, and I play games. I do. I do. Mainly board games. I love playing games with people. I love playing games with my son. In fact, that's what we're going to be doing tonight at home as a family, is family game night, because we haven't got to do that since he's been at scout camp, and we've missed playing games. We love playing games so much that God introduced us to an organization called Game Church. An organization that exists to bridge the gap between the gamer and the gospel one game at a time. And you guys know a lot about this because I talk a lot about this. We just went on a mission with Game Church to Phoenix. And I just wonder, it's like, wow, God, you didn't take away my passion for gaming. You elevated it. You gave it purpose. You gave it meaning. You used it for your kingdom purposes here on earth as it is in heaven so others could find you through me. God wants to do that very same work in you. When we ask about this thing called calling, where is it even found? Remember, you are God's masterpieces created in Christ Jesus. That Jesus has done this wonderful work in your life so that he could, yes, change you, take away things that didn't need to be there, but also elevate the things that are already there in you for the good work that he prepared for you beforehand. Can we know it, though? Can we know the calling? Can we find it? Absolutely we can. And it begins in death. It begins in giving up our selfish, our selfish desire. Again, in Christ, it could be a painful thing. To be risen and born again in Christ, it could be a painful thing. It can cost you friends. It can cost you careers. It can cost your life. But we have to remember when Christ calls a man, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, he bids him come and die. If you've ever wondered where you could find calling, where it could be found, if you ever wondered, is there more to life than this? Remember the more begins here. It begins with Jesus. And to walk with Jesus, we have been called to die. To die to who we were and to be risen again in Christ. Maybe you struggled finding this thing called calling in your life. Maybe you've struggled finding what it truly, that purpose that God has given you. I ask that we would ask through the Spirit of God, have we truly died? Have we let go of what was former? to take hold of what was now? Have we let go of our former lives? Have we been buried in our baptism, like Paul said, so that we could be risen again in Christ, in the newness of life that he comes to bring? Asking, Lord, have we died? Are we willing to die? Are we willing to take up our cross, laying down the life that was before, to follow you to the life that you promised to bring, living in the fullness of the abundance of life that he promised. We will only find the thing we call calling, purpose, and mission. We will only find the more there is to this life if we would truly come and die. This is the word of the Lord. And the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. At this time, I'd like to 